Welcome. I see a bunch of people connecting to audio, so I'll give everyone a moment here to join before I start talking and dig in. Thanks for your patience waiting for us. Awesome. Got a bunch of people trickling in. Great. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to Ask the Alliance. I'm so thrilled you are all joining us. And we have Emily today sharing about birding. I wanted to share a little bit about the Alliance. So the Alliance is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to bring together communities, companies, and conservationists to improve our lands and waters in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Last summer, the Alliance hosted a series which we called Breakfast on the Bay, and we partnered with um, our partners throughout the watershed to share their experience and explore kind of the impact that we have on the bay. Our staff at the Alliance continues to grow, which means our expertise does it as well. And so this year, we're really excited to share really our Alliance staff, their passion and their, their knowledge for different areas of, of enjoyment throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed, uh, just so we can learn how we can have, um, how we can both enjoy and improve the health of the Chesapeake Bay through recreation activities that we all like to partake in. So I just wanted to go through some quick housekeeping things with you all um, with the hope with, for these sessions to be interactive. You feel free to join us with your camera on if you'd like to, but please remain on mute as Emily is sharing her presentation. You will have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the session. Feel free to submit those through the chat throughout and I'd be happy to share those with Emily at the very end of our call. Um, so with that today, I'm really excited to welcome and introduce Emily. She is our Pennsylvania Green Infrastructures Project Coordinator, and she's going to share all about her passion for birding in the watershed. So with that, Emily, I'll pass it over to you. Alrighty, thank you, Lauren. So I am um, just going to run through a few slides here. Just Lauren already introduced the Alliance, but just a little bit more background about um, our work and what we do. Um, our work is very collaborative. We couldn't do it without um, kind of grouping different organizations, the community, corporations together. Um, so we have four offices in um, throughout the watershed, Annapolis, Lancaster, Richmond, and DC. So in those four offices, we have work in four program areas agriculture, forests, green infrastructure, and stewardship and engagement. And I really want to highlight how these four program areas really have direct and indirect benefits um, in terms of habitat restoration um, direct that directly impacts and benefits our local bird populations. So our forest, shout out to our forest team, planting all those trees and stewardship and engagement for bringing all the volunteers on board to get trees in the ground. And where we can, green infrastructure is um, as much about managing stormwater as providing habitat when possible. You see in that little rain garden there that provides um, habitat in the form of different native plants. And then our agriculture team kind of encouraging farmers and connecting farmers with resources to implement best management and conservation practices on their land, which helps water quality all of those good things end up helping birds, so, and wildlife in general. So just wanted to highlight that. Um, just a quick overview here of, um, of the presentation today. I'm not gonna get too, too technical. I think that there are a lot of experts out there who <laughs> know a lot more than I do. Um, and I'm happy to send you their way um, if you have further questions, but I kind of thought I would just share my personal experience with birding and you can kind of take what resonates with you and and if it sticks and um, apply it to your own to your own journey in birding but I'll do a quick identification overview some resources that are available and then um, we did get some questions ahead of time so that was great and so have some of those that we can address at the end and feel free to um, send Lauren your questions throughout the presentation as you have them. And I'll touch a little bit on equipment. You can bird without equipment, certainly, but there are some things that do help out with being able to see little tiny creatures that are far away. So, and I'd like to end then kind of with the conservation connection 
And um, I, I take it that if you're here today, you kind of are interested enough and curious enough to find out some more and likely what you can do in your own, in your own um, backyard perhaps, or in your own kind of own action steps that you can take to help out birds. So um, with that, I'll just share how I kind of got started with birding. Um, it was never that I disliked birds at all. It was more um, that I didn't really realize how cool they were and that they were kind of right there. They were always around me, but I just never kind of, I just, I wasn't tuning in. So in college I had taken a, it was actually a geology field trip. And on this field trip, there was um, a biology professor who was along and we were, it was in the evening and we were kind of on a lake shore and the sun had already started going down, but um, so it's kind of dusk, not great lighting. And a bird took off and the biology professor called out what the bird was and you could barely see the bird. And I just thought that was so cool how he was able to just based on flight pattern, general size, shape, and um, now a little bit later, I'm realizing the habitat clues that he probably had, but I thought, wow, that's really cool. So even though it was a geology field trip, I kind of tucked that away and thought, hmm, I, I didn't act on it right then, but I was kind of interested in how could, I, how could I learn more about birds. So fast forward a little bit, and I ended up taking his ornithology field course which was just a really great experience to have um, a couple weeks in the field with a lot of mentoring, which um, I wanna emphasize to everyone is kind of one of the best ways to learn is just to get out in the field, hopefully buddy up with someone who can point out some things to you. When I came home from that experience, I thought, oh gosh, this is a lot harder than I thought because no, no one was um, pointing the birds out to me and where to look, but there, it's, it's all a, um, it's all kind of a progression and you start to just take those experiences and build on them. So um, I have this bird here, which is a tree swallow. Uh, that is one of um, our aerial insectivores in the watershed, very common in open fields or over open water this time of year. And I have it here because it was one of the first birds that I saw through binoculars. And that color, the turquoise just kind of jumped out at me and I thought, wow, that is just, again, it was always around me, but I, was, I wasn't tuning in. So that was one of the birds that once I saw it through the binoculars was kind of, um, kind of a game changer. And I kind of thought, what else, you know, what else am I missing? So um, to kind of come down from that a little bit, we do have some very concerning news about birds in general in terms of um, just their conservation status. So um, the scientific community has studied population trends um, of North American birds as well as global birds and have estimated that we've lost almost 3 billion birds since 1970, which is really kind of alarming. Um, birds are the most, I guess, vis one of the most visible species that we can see in an ecosystem. So they are excellent indicators of an overall environmental health. Um, so when we kind of think about losing this many birds, we kind of think about what, what other um, types of biodiversity or ecosystem services are we losing? And are we kind of past some tipping points, which obviously we don't want to happen. So in other, in other words, um, that statistic equates to one in four birds that we used to experience throughout North America no longer being here. And that's across multiple um, biomes and habitat groups, even habitat generalists that occupy different types of habitat are um, experiencing population decline. So even our very familiar common backyard birds, so our northern cardinals, our bluebirds, um, our blue jays and song sparrows, even these species that tend to occupy different types of habitat in relative equal numbers are experiencing declines. So um, I guess the message that I also want to impart today is to kind of think about in your own in your own realm, what you can do to kind of help reverse some of these really 
concerning trends. Obviously, there are things, there are multiple factors. It's not just one thing causing these declines. Habitat loss, um, pesticide use among maybe the more concerning ones, um, climate change complicating some of these, these um, steep declines. So just kind of thinking what I could do in my own, the actions that I have control of and what could I do to improve habitat right where I'm at. So we'll get to that um, later on here as we move on. But this, this report is available um, um, if you go to Cornell Ornithology, Lab of Ornithology, there's links to this um, study so you can kind of read more in depth about it. Um, getting into some resources that are available. When I first started birding, um, the Cornell Lab was an excellent resource as was Audubon as far as having uh, kind of an online landing page. And those resources have only grown tenfold since, um, since my recent start in birding. So I would really encourage you to check out um, the Cornell Lab online. Um, they have a website all about birds and every species kind of with a species account, photos, similar species, range maps. Very, very helpful to kind of, um, if you are trying to identify a bird to read up about it if you don't have a physical hard copy of a field guide. Uh, the Cornell Lab also runs um, one of the largest citizen science um, observation projects, which is called eBird. And when I first started birding, I didn't think that I, I wasn't confident enough in my skills to think that I should record any of my observations on eBird. And, um, and I was mistaken because um, Cornell doesn't expect you to be an expert to contribute your observations. All observations have scientific value. So as you go through a checklist and you mark down what you're seeing, and you know that, oh gosh, I know I saw four or five other birds, but I can't identify them. That's completely fine. And on the bottom of the checklist, you can simply mark, um, I identified all the birds that I was able to identify. So if there were birds that you weren't able to identify, that kind of is taken care of in that question. And eBird's a really cool resource in terms of having a place also as, as a birder to sort of keep track of your, of your sighting. So it's much more organized than if I would have just tried to do this all by hand in a notebook, which I attempted at first and then kind of quickly becomes um, hard to keep track of. And it's just neat. It, it creates a map for you of where you've seen different um, birds. You can click on states all the way down to counties to see where you've submitted lists and you can upload photo media and sound media. So it's a really great resource. I encourage you to explore it. And then kind of as an extension of the Cornell Lab, there is a, um, an app through Cornell um, to assist with bird ID. So it's called Merlin and there's various ways to identify a bird. If you have a photo, you can upload a photo and it can try to recognize it. Um, it will even recognize sound. So as you're on a hike, it, it's really it's really cool. It might hear birds in the background that might have been too too high pitched for you to hear, or it kind of tunes you in. Oh, okay, maybe I should look for a cardinal. That's the sound that I keep hearing. And then you can kind of look around and find it. it there is a caveat, it is, it is um, computer-based. It's, it's not, um, it's basing those, I guess, um, uh, those birds that it's hearing on all of the uploaded sound recordings that it currently has. So it's not perfect. It's not a perfect um, fit every time, but often it can kind of point you in the right direction. And if you're not sure, you can always submit a question to a local birding group or social media group um, if you need help there. But um, so check out Merlin, it's free to download as an app on your phone. Um, there are other online apps that you can, can explore as well. That's just one that I happen to use and have found it kind of fun to interact with. Um, I still like a traditional hard copy field guide um, to leaf through. And I, when I started birding, started writing down the dates of when I saw things in, right in the book. And that's great until you lose the book. And then you think, oh man. So <laughs> that's where eBird comes in handy and has that on electronic record. 
but um, Peterson Field Guide is one of the older field guides, has obviously been updated over the years, but it was one of the first field guides to popularize the system of um, pointing out different field marks that can help you differentiate very similar species. So maybe um, two very similar sized birds have, one has an eye ring and one doesn't, or one has a wing bar and the other doesn't. So that book kind of has little arrows that point to important field marks that can help you distinguish um, different birds. And then if you are thinking, oh, that's great, but I'm not really sure I'm ready to buy a field guide. Um, these are generally always available at your local library. So you can check one out and leaf through it and use it in the field and see if it feels comfortable, if it, see if it um, is kind of, if its organization style makes sense to you. And it could be that you start out with one field guide as a beginning birder, and then you might graduate to another field guide that makes a little bit more sense. This is organized the Sibley's taxonomically as well as Peterson's. Some others are organized maybe by color, um, but it is good to familiarize yourself with the general bird uh, family groups so that um, as you're leafing through it, you can kind of find the section that your bird would most likely be, be found. Um, this little Sibley's uh, leaflet is also available kind of highlighting if you just kind of want, I just want the highlights of the backyard birds just to kind of get started. That's maybe seven or eight dollars. You could probably find that online somewhere um, as just kind of a resource to get started. Um, so one of the biggest things in terms of identification is really just taking inventory of like the general size and shape of the bird. So um, if you are looking at a bird, this is, I took a screenshot here from the Merlin app. It's going to ask you, okay, was the bird robin sized or was it, if I click on this smallest bird, is it more of like a sparrow sized or is it you know smaller than a sparrow? So, this one here, is it crow sized or is it larger than a crow? Is it more of like a duck or a goose size? So having those kind of general size, general sizes in your mind of um, different birds can kind of help narrow down possibilities. So um, one of the things that I would like to encourage everyone to do is to, um, just to kind of study the birds that are right around them in, in your backyard. So you might think, oh, I know a robin. I don't need to study a robin. Um, but if you take some time and just to kind of really linger on those birds that you're seeing and just kind of taking in all the qualities that you can and getting that, really kind of internalizing that general impression of size and shape. So um, when you see that bird in a new location, you can be even more confident of what you're seeing and hearing if it's low light or there are other variables that kind of make it harder to see. And you might be more familiar with its habit, you know, if it scratches on the ground for food or if it um, is generally up in the treetops, you kind of have a sense of its behavior as well. Um, so one of the um, schools of thought in terms of uh, birding identification is in the Cape May School is this idea of general impression of size and shape. And it's something that you can, um, you just kind of become more comfortable with over time, but you can look more up about that, but it tends to use the same region of your brain that would have to do with facial recognition. So sometimes you can't say exactly what makes one person look different than another person, but you just, you just sort of know. And so that comes with time as you, again, really get to know, um, really get to know the birds as you're seeing them. And birders were guilty of seeing a bird and then kind of, oh, what other birds are out there? But um, as you're learning, don't be afraid to spend more time looking at a bird um, when it's there and available and um, you have a good, good look at it. So if you're going to be looking at these birds in your backyard, um, you might wonder, well, could I put a bird feeder up to help you know, to help attract them and so that I can see them. And you're certainly welcome to do that. I generally put a bird feeder up in the winter time when it might be harder for birds to find uh, resources, especially if there's snow on the ground. It's nice to put up a sunflower 
or suet feeder a couple of days ahead of a snowstorm so the birds can kind of have that extra fuel to get through the cold weather. But um, the best bird feeders are really the bird feeders that you plant, right? So um, if you wanna see more blue jays in your yard, you can plant an oak tree. And if you wanna see um, ruby-throated hummingbirds in your yard, you might attract them with planting this native, it's called monarda or bee balm. They're really attracted to the color red. So if you're thinking, oh, you know, I don't wanna to have to worry about cleaning the water in the hummingbird feeder, this is a really, really great option to have um, a native plant that kind of attracts the, the hummingbird right in. Cardinal flower is also another one that hummingbirds are attracted to if you have any damp areas or moist soil that cardinal flower would do well in. Um, but more on the, the oaks, I'm sure many people have heard of Doug Tallamy's work and he kind of, um, the Carolina chickadee, I forgot to put a picture of that one, but is sort of the poster child of the, the bird world that needs caterpillars to raise its young. And where is it gonna find those caterpillars? On oak trees. So oak trees just support so many more um, different species of moths and um, different caterpillar insect species that um, they need to rear their young. So they're not actually feeding their young sunflower seeds. They're sort of um, doing all of these foraging trips back and forth to an oak tree to find enough caterpillars to raise, to raise their young. So in addition to supporting blue jays, there's going to be a lot of other bird species that you're supporting as well with um, planting a keystone species like an oak. Other really highly rated um, native trees might be um, our native cherries or willows or um, black walnuts, et cetera. So um, if you have the space for it, I really <laughs> encourage um, to think about an oak. And again, some more of these natural bird feeders that plant it and they will come. So if you wanna see cedar waxwings, go ahead and plant a service berry. If you wanna see a great catbird, go ahead and plant a service berry, a northern mockingbird, go ahead and plant a service berry. And if you want to see an American robin, <laughs> you might already have them in your yard, but if you wanna help your American robin friends, you can plant a service berry. I wanted to include this picture just so you can see how prolific the berry production is on, on service berry. And it gets these really lovely little flowers in the spring. So it's um, edible to both humans and to, um, to birds. So you'll likely see uh, multiple species that will take advantage of this plant. Um, going back to the cedar waxwing, I even saw a picture of a cedar waxwing on a service berry in downtown Philly. So <laughs> even though we don't think of cedar waxwings as urban birds typically, um, when there's a food resource, they are kind of nomadic. And if they find it, they might um, congregate and take advantage of it. So um, I just think that's a really beautiful bird, almost looks like a painting and it's dark mask. Uh, so it has these little red tips on its wing, which where it is where it gets its name, wax wing. Um, so I promise that you'll enjoy um, a lot more bird diversity if you plant service berry or another similar native species versus something like um, this Bradford pear. So um, unfortunately, we have a lot of Bradford pear throughout the Mid-Atlantic region, and it is unfortunately invasive. It's a non-native. And perhaps it's widely planted because it gets these nice little white blooms in the early spring, but we know that service berry gets those little blooms too. So, um, and they generally kind of grow like into a similar um, height. So this, if you ever travel on a highway in early April, you can kind of see the date on the photos there. Throughout the mid-Atlantic region, you might see these kind of ribbons of white blooms along the side of the highway. And it's really pretty until you realize, oh wait, hold on, that's Bradford pear. So um, the thing that's just so unfortunate about this Bradford pear is that it doesn't support nearly as many insects as our native oaks do. So when you look at this photo, that whole area along the side of the highway could be a lot more biologically productive. And it's just kind of simply this area that's not 
having as great of a, a value in terms of ecosystem service. Um, this new house that was built has a Bradford pear planted in front of it. And um, had they planted service berry, they would have been able to enjoy, um, in my prediction, a lot more um, diversity of bird life. So um, another one of our common invasive plants that seems to kind of just take over and then we'll, we'll look at how it might affect birds, um, invasive English ivy. So you're thinking, well, in this application here where it is kind of in this nice landscaped bed, it does look very attractive. Um, you think, how could it get outside of these lines? <laughs> um, but plants have a way of growing and once ivy arborizes and produces berries. Birds, especially robins, eat these berries and spread them far and wide. So you might think, well, what's so bad if robins are eating the berries, what's so bad? Um, well, this is a park very close to my house where I frequently go birding. Um, and this is an American sycamore tree. And I roughly estimated just kind of on the diameter of the trunk that it might've been at least 200 years old. And so you can kind of see it's almost reaching the canopy there. And so this really old tree that might have a lot more life left in it without the ivy is a lot more susceptible to um, storm damage. It's interfering with the oxy oxygen exchange um, in the bark. And um, we'll see later also affecting other, other species that then, because it's changing the overall habitat structure. So if we were to lose this tree prematurely to ivy, Think about all of the habitat there that um, is no longer quite as available to the birds. So all of the leaves that are supporting caterpillars, um, the birds that are using the little nooks and crannies as nesting cavities, uh, the owl that's sitting up there kind of peering over everything, um, orioles that might be making their nests hanging um, in those branches, all of those other species would begin to be affected. So, um, We'll see here, this is a, um, another area of infestation of English ivy, and we can kind of think about other species that might be affected if it's, as it starts to climb up these trees and carpet the floor. So I have um, a tree that was near my house, a silver maple that ivy was starting to encroach upon, and I thought, yeah, I would really, really large maple, and I thought, I'd really like to see this tree um, not be, <laughs> affected by this ivy. So I was pulling it out, trying to keep a ring around the tree. And um, a few weeks later, I went back to that spot to kind of, you know, keep up with the effort. And I see this little, this isn't my photo, P.S., but <laughs> I see this little brown creeper. And brown creepers have a foraging habit of going up the trunks to look for little insects inside the bark crevices. And so I felt so happy because I thought, if the ivy had been allowed to grow up the trunk, then this bird would have a lot harder time finding um, all of the insects because of the way it forages. So um, even though one type of bird might be able to use the bear, eat the berries, like the robins, I'll, I'll tend to see flocks of robins in the winter eating these berries, it um, can have unintended consequences for other species then. So when we have this type of situation where it's just carpeting the forest floor, we can think about other birds that are affected um, that have a foraging habit of kind of scratching up at the leaf litter and looking for seeds or insects under that leaf litter. So birds that tend to have that type of habit, um, white-throated sparrow, they are here mostly in the winter. They're a winter visitor for us, same as uh, dark-eyed junco and eastern tohi um, has that very pronounced scratching habit in the leaf litter. So if that element of the ecosystem becomes compromised from this other plant that's choking everything out and limiting regeneration of trees. Um, there's going to kind of be those ripple effects for other bird um, populations. And oven bird um, actually makes its nest in leaf litter, kind of like a dome-shaped little nest, very camouflaged in the leaf litter. So um, yeah, it would probably have a lot harder time rearing its young or even making its nest in the first place if the ivy is there kind of um, changing that aspect of, of the ecosystem. So we kind of talked about this already. Um, doesn't 
doesn't wildlife adapt? We have robins that eat the ivy um, berries. And here's another example of Myla Minute. And if you're not familiar with this plant, um, you can grab a hold of it and become very familiar with it very quickly. It has these little spines that are very unpleasant to touch. So if you're pulling it out, it's very easy to pull out, but you do need to have gloves. Um, so this is another one that can quickly carpet or blanket an area. And um, going back to this um, local park where I uh, typically go birding, um, I noticed that there started to be a small patch of this and I thought, okay, well, it's not too much. I'll, I'll pull some of it out. So I did that. And then um, underneath all of this mile a minute was this native jewelweed. And it's the same area where I had been seeing a little ruby-throated hummingbird kind of coming and visiting the jewelweed. And jewelweed blooms in late August, early September. So it's a really important food source for this little guy, um, especially as they're kind of preparing for migration in the fall. So there's kind of um, these unintended consequences when we have invasive plants and, and it's one of those other things that kind of, um, that are affecting our bird populations. So I kind of want to shift into just kind of from those just personal stories that, um, that I have had throughout birding, but um, some of the questions that came in before the presentation. So someone asked, um, we'll go through some of those and um, hopefully I'll address some of those questions. And again, if not, just um, forward them to Lauren here and we'll get them at the end. But someone wondered, they had um, a small lot with slow stormwater drainage and which plants and trees are best for feeding birds. So um, without knowing how much sun you have, I would, um, and I know, you said, I know you said you had a small space, but I'll just put out the disclaimer. If you have the space for it, plant a large keystone tree, like a swamp white oak, if you have poor drainage, or maybe a sycamore, or they like moist feet, um, perhaps uh, a river birch or another type, type of native keystone, keystone plant, um, maybe a red maple. Um, but if you don't quite have space for those, here are some smaller options that are still going to have a lot of ecological value. Um, our native switchgrass, I think, is really underutilized as a name, as a landscape plant. So it gets um, some of the cultivars, you can do straight species, which is lovely. Some of the cultivars have gorgeous um, red hues of foliage in the fall. And this plant, not only does it um, support some native um, skipper moths, it, the seed heads are going to um, provide food, a source of food for some of those birds in the winter that kind of scratch at the ground as part of their foraging. So your song sparrows, your white-throated sparrows, your juncos, they're all going to appreciate that you have this plant in your landscape. And switchgrass is a native uh, prairie plant that's also native in, uh, into the mid-Atlantic and its roots can grow up to six feet or more. So it's very drought tolerant once it's established, but it's one of the prairie grasses that doesn't mind getting partially inundated. So it's often recommended for um, rain gardens and that type of thing. If you have room for a rain garden and you are looking for some a plant that's gonna provide some nice coverage, this would be a great option. Um, in addition, if you're looking for something smaller but still really valuable for birds, uh, black chokeberry or red chokeberry, uh, it, it's a multi-stem shrub, so it gets to be in the neighborhood of 15-ish feet, maybe 10 to 15 feet, uh, little white flowers followed by these dark fruits that are super nutritious for birds when um, they're preparing for migration or when they're overwintering. And, um, yeah, I just, I just had a local birding friend who reported that they saw a red-headed woodpecker <laughs> eating chokeberry berries, which was just really cool, really cool to hear. So it also kind of gets this very attractive foliage in the fall. These are not the only two plants that might be good options. There's certainly a long, 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 long list of possible solutions. So you can look up native plant lists specific to your um, specific to your state or eco region, and that would be a good, good place to start. But just wanted to throw a few ideas out there. 
Someone else was wondering, uh, how would you recommend finding a local bird watching community? Um, so Audubon has over 450 national chapters and I tried to get fit as many, as much of the watershed as I could on this screenshot, but you can kind of see some of the ones that are listed here in Maryland, up into Pennsylvania, where I'm at in Lancaster, we're not affiliated with um, a national Audubon chapter. So it, but we do have a local birding group and we communicate um, with the Appalachian and the York Audubon societies. And um, so that might be the case in other areas where you don't see any labels, but if there's none listed for your area, uh, you can click on one of these and there's contact information that pops up and reach out to, um, to the contact person listed there and see if you could get involved or if they know of anything closer to you as far as um, field trip opportunities. And that's gonna be one of the best ways that you start to get familiar with your local birds is just getting out in the field with others who are um, able to, to point things out to you or to point out a song to you. And then you're, you kind of get familiar with some of the local hotspots. So some of the um, groups on Facebook or other social, mostly Facebook, but um, there's a number of birding groups, uh, local, local birding groups there that you can check out to see if um, are close to you. And if you have an ID question, follow the group rules, but generally speaking, um, you can post a photo there if you're not quite sure you're not quite sure that you're getting um, a correct ID from one of the computer apps that's you know not not run by a person it's just a computer so if you kind of want that nuanced description of can you help me identify this often the birding community is very very helpful in that way and wanting to um, help you on your journey so any birds that you don't want in your yard um, two that I'll highlight here are non-native invasive species and these two species are uh, not protected by the Federal Migratory Bird Act. So all other birds um, are, are federal, federally protected as migratory species unless there are separate, um, separate rules if they're a game species, uh, depending on your state. But, but these guys here, house sparrow and European starling, they um, are somewhat aggressive in terms of outcompeting our native birds who also are cavity nesters. So we have Eastern bluebirds, we have chickadees and house wrens um, that all, tree swallows that all enjoy um, nesting in, in uh, tree cavities if there are any, if there's dead standing wood, if there's not, in absence of that, there might be a box that someone has installed, but house sparrows are known to go in and, um, and kill bluebirds and um, starlings, you can kind of see it popping out of a tree cavity there. That could have been a nest site for a native bird, like a chickadee or a tree swallow. So um, starlings are generally uh, species that tend to roost together they congregate at the end of the day in large roost sites. Uh, house sparrows can just be really numerous and um, boisterous. They have a loud cheep, 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 very loud cheep sound that they make. Um, so yeah, if you have these, there's not a whole lot that you can do other than kind of improving your habitat as much as you can, hoping that you attract native birds. Um, one thing I'll add here as far as house sparrows uh, and starlings, there are some techniques you can employ to help reduce the risk of a sparrow or a starling taking up residence in a nest box that you install, but I would encourage you to read up on that um, if you're going to put up a nest box and just to kind of monitoring the, ne the nest box is probably the best thing that you can do. Um, so I mentioned earlier that binoculars can really be game changers if you're just getting into birding because it just, it opens up a whole new world. You're like, wow, I didn't know there was so much detail. Um, so a couple of things, uh, you don't want to get too much magnification. And the general reason for that is because as you increase the magnification, um, it becomes harder to find and focus on your um, subject. So as you increase 
the magnification, you can kind of see in the graphic here, your field of vision kind of narrows. So as that field of vision narrows, if you put your binoculars up, it's you're limited to uh, your uh, more narrow, um, more narrow field of view. So if you kind of there's a lot more um, combinations than what is listed here, but these are some good ones to start with. So eight by thirty two is generally a very comfortable size for birding. If you want a little bit wider field of vision, eight by forty two is um, a little makes it a little bit easier there to find your subject. But another thing to consider is how much light it lets in. So, and that can have to do with the quality of the glass, et cetera. So I would encourage anyone interested in thinking about buying a pair of binoculars that um, a lot of birding stores will generally allow you to test them in person before you buy. It is a little bit of an investment. You can get a decent pair though, probably for under $200. And, um, Hopefully you could test those before you buy so that you're not disappointed and kind of making sure that it's comfortable for your face and everything. So, and there's also a number of brands, but um, just kind of just read some articles and do your research there as far as um, what might be a good fit for your budget. And um, I'll end on this. When is the best time of year to spot birds? and really any time of year. So the more that you're outside, the more likely that you're going to see a bird and be able to observe it and identify it. So I don't wanna limit anyone to a certain time of year. There are different species of birds that we have in the watershed at different times of the year. So um, if I said, you're really gonna see a lot more birds during spring and fall migration, well, that might be true. There might be a lot of diversity, a lot of warblers that you're, that you're seeing in the spring with vibrant colors and they're just stopping here and heading to Canada. Um, you know, July and August can still be really exciting bird months. So here in Lancaster, we just had this past weekend, someone who observed four wood storks at a local reservoir and which is a very uncommon bird for this area. So um, shorebird migration is kind of heating up in the months of July and August. So. You might not have warblers in July and August that are migrating through, um, but you'll get to see as the more that you're out there, the more chance that you'll have to see something and start to learn different species. But um, it is true that in the spring, you might be hearing more birds and primarily birds in the spring are advertising to mates or they are defending territory. So there's more to, I. There's more to talk about, I guess, for the birds in the spring. And there's not to say that there's not bird song this time of year, but it does noticeably get a little quieter, kind of a lull. But uh, I do want to encourage you just uh, to get out there and, and see what you see. And that's kind of the best way to get your, to get your feet wet. Um, so yeah, I'll end there and I'll just kind of I'll offer um, that any conservation measures you can take in your own yard to, to really just um, plant those native plants, attract those birds, plant it and they will come. And then one other thing as we're kind of heading into uh, fall migration, light pollution is also a big concern over large cities. So if you remember at night to just turn your light out, that can be, um, that can kind of help reduce the, uh, the glow over a city and the birds are navigating mostly from midnight to 6 a.m. So if, um, or if you can get like a motion light or something like that, that's going to kind of help reduce that light pollution that birds are up against. But um, I'll kind of stop there and see where we're at with, with questions. Um, I think that you actually hit every single question that was sent in ahead of time. So that was awesome. Um, I don't think we had any um, more questions come through the chat. Just a comment on um, Lauren lives in Washington, D.C. and has bird feeders that get swarmed by sparrows, starlings, and grackles. I have a native plant garden, but the sparrows are everywhere. What was her, what's her comment? <laughs> yeah, so Lauren, I commiserate with you because I have the same problem. I have um, a number of house sparrows at my house, and I'm just, as much as I want to put a bird feeder out, I'm 
a little nervous that it might encourage them. So um, I haven't personally put a feeder out, but if you enjoy watching, for example, the grackles are a native bird and they're a little bit aggressive, but um, if you enjoy watching them, yeah, there's not, um, there's not really a silver bullet for that one, but just keep what you're doing with the native plants and hopefully continuing to just provide that, um, that habitat if other birds come in. And even if those invasive birds are eating the berries on some of your native plants, when they fly away and spread those seeds, at least they're spreading native seeds. So I guess that's <laughs> the best we can do for that one. Just a lot of thanks and kudos to you, Emily, in the chat, which is awesome. Um, I know this was very informative for me, um, even just going over some basics, great resources you shared. And I think there's a lot for us to kind of walk away with and, and sit on a little bit. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, following this call, everyone will receive an email from me with a link to watch the recording. Of course, if you have any questions after this conversation, um, you can feel free to respond to that email directly, and I'll be sure to get your question either to Emily or answer it myself. Um, but yeah, from myself and on behalf of the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Bye.